Thank you all so much for joining us here for Adobe's Digital Literacy Cafe. Um, my name is Shauna Chung. I'm an assistant professor of English at the New York City College of Technology. I'll be moderating today's session and just wanted to remind everyone again that the content presented today is being recorded. It will be available on demand due to the size of this webinar. We don't have chat functions available for attendees, but we do have the Q&A feature up and running. So feel free to use that. Uh, it should be the, uh, near the bottom of your screen next to your Zoom controls. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's get into today's discussion topic. So I know on my campus, as well as campuses around the world, artificial intelligence is really on everyone's minds and it seems to be the theme of nearly every workshop that I'm seeing, particularly when it comes to generative AI. But also against this backdrop are these perennial concerns when it comes to student success, to learning outcomes, and also to career readiness. And I know that these are all focused areas that cut across disciplines, across institutions in higher ed. And these are all topics that often leave us with more questions than answers. And so today I'm joined by four incredible panelists who are thinking through problems and solutions related to generative AI to career skills, as well as learning outcomes. And in this session, you'll hear them discuss how AI is both impacting and also opening opportunities on their campuses, and also calling us to think more expansively about teaching and learning in the 21st century. So I'm gonna turn things over to our panelists now who will introduce themselves and also situate their work and their role alongside today's theme on generative AI, career skills and learning outcomes. And then we'll have uh, we'll continue the discussion in a more extemporaneous and conversational manner. So let's start with University of Miami's Dr. Matt Acevedo. Thank you so much, Shauna. Um, so hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Matt Acevedo. I'm the Executive Director of Learning Innovation and Faculty Engagement at the University of Miami, where I lead an amazing team of instructional designers and technologists who collaborate with faculty members and university partners to promote a campus culture of teaching and learning through educational technology and innovation. Um, I also teach in the Applied Learning Sciences doctoral program at U Miami, so I'm, I'm there with students in the classroom too. So my background is in instructional design and faculty development. So promoting student learning and creating impactful learning experiences is always at the top of mind for me. I think what's new for me and really for all of us is thinking through how generative AI is going to impact teaching and learning, whether you're in higher ed like me or K-12 or other learning spaces. So part of me feels that nothing has changed. Sound pedagogy transcends any type of technology that might come our way. But then the other part of me also feels that everything has changed. We've, we're, we're dealing with a new technology that is I think for better or worse, going to change how people live, how people work, how they learn, and how they play. Uh, so in the context of the intersection of promoting student learning outcomes and generative AI, which is the focus of today's session, um, I think a helpful framework for us is to think of our learning outcomes in relation to AI in terms of learning about AI, learning with AI, and learning from AI. So I have one slide that I'd like to share with everybody, if you'll give me a sec to bring that up. So learning about AI is the idea that our student learning outcomes relate to AI itself. So AI becomes the subject matter. We can think of this in terms of promoting AI literacy. So examples of this, of this are teaching students how to use AI systems, how these things work, the risks and limitations in regard to things like bias and hallucinations. So if I'm teaching a unit on this, I might have a learning outcome, like students will be able to explain how bias manifests in generative AI outputs. And an activity that I might have in the, in the classroom that relates to this outcome is have students generate text and images and then have them discuss any perceived biases that they see in the outputs. So that's learning about AI. Um, I think there's a lot of potential, uh, probably the most in learning with AI, where we have students use AI tools in ways that they're applied in teaching and in, I'm sorry, in learning in, in meaningful and realistic ways. So I know today we'll be discussing a little bit about career competencies. 
our students eventually are go- going to go out into the quote unquote real world or the the post education world where they're going to be using these these skills. And I think it's on us as educators to uh, help them develop those skills. So this might be something like. Uh, students will be able to develop a product marketing campaign, but the activity that they're doing is using Adobe Firefly to create the relevant imagery as part of that marketing campaign. And then the third sort of division that I'm I'm thinking through with this framework is learning from AI, where purpose-built AI tools are used to augment instruction. This might include things like AI-based tutors or virtual role-playing agents. So at the University of Miami, we're working through some prototypes of having some foreign language tutors that assist students who are learning foreign languages in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures learn advanced grammar and and language concepts through interacting with AI-based tutors. Uh, Another thing that personally I'm playing with uh, for my course in the Applied Learning Sciences program is having students interact with virtual role-playing agents. So I teach a course on designing workplace learning. A a big part of the instructional design process is collaborating with subject matter experts. Unfortunately, we don't have access to a lot of real-world subject matter experts, but by creating a virtual agent that takes on the role of of a virtual subject matter expert, students can can work with the virtual agents through the in, in service of the development of instructional materials. So another one from a, a marketing sort of course might be students will be able to collaborate with a product manager to develop a marketing campaign. And the activity there is that the virtual product manager is, is AI powered. So it's an AI powered tutor um, and the students would interact with it toward the development of the marketing campaign. So for me, in terms of student learning outcomes, it's helpful to think of it in terms of learning about AI, learning about AI itself, learning with AI in ways that might transcend the classroom spaces when students go out into a a post-education environment, and then learning from AI with purpose-built tools that uh, we use to augment instruction. Uh, So that was a lot. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm going to turn it back over to Shauna to introduce our next panelist. Thank you so much, Matt. You just laid a super cool framework that I can't wait to dive into a little bit more later this session. Thank you so much. So next is University of Arizona's Dr. Melody Buckner. Hello, everyone. Uh, wow, Matt, that was impressive. I'm I'm kind of blown away by that framework. I want to unpack that a little bit. Um, I, I don't have a slide, but I am going to show you a website. So first, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Melody Buckner. I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Digital Learning and Online Initiatives here at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And I um, oversee the Teaching and Learning Center, uh, and we serve all uh, 21 colleges here at the University of Arizona. And um, one of the things we have been looking at um, starting last fall was artificial intelligence. And I'm going to bring up, um, I'm going to share my screen real real quick and then probably take it back. Um, But this is um, the website that we developed last fall. um, And it was a grassroots effort um, for artificial intelligence at the University of Arizona. We are a research one university, so they are doing a lot of research in this area. Um, But we also um, developed some areas around teaching and learning and also about community, how we can support community through um, artificial intelligence. So we have a a couple of different ways that we're looking at artificial intelligence. This was, a, like I said, a grassroots kind of effort. It comes out of our research and development area, and um, they wanted to get everybody in the university kind of involved. We had over 500 faculty that volunteered to serve on working communities last fall around artificial intelligence, One of the things that my unit did, um, along with some of my colleagues, was help um, develop a statement for the syllabus, which I think is really important, kind of gives guidance for faculty about how they might want to use artificial intelligence in their classroom. We decided not to do a big P policy, but rather a little P policy around artificial intelligence, um, really giving faculty um, you know, agency uh, in their classroom are about how they want to um, use artificial intelligence. This is available for everybody. It's just artificialintelligence.arizona.edu. So I'm not going to go much into that, but that's a resource that you have if you want to um, to look at that. 
you know, I teach um, at different levels. Um, my faculty appointment is in the College of Education, and I teach a freshman class in the fall, every fall. But I also teach 400 level and then all the way up to graduate level. And I started talking with my students about artificial intelligence. And I came up with a new kind of fun term that I like called authentic intelligence, which is, um, you know, you have the artificial. And, and I know as I was walking into work, I was thinking, OK, what is an example of artificial intelligence versus authentic intelligence? And I don't know about you, but have you ever like gotten on the phone and gotten in one of those loops and you are just finally screaming at the phone, customer service, customer service, <laughs> because you were in a really bad AI loop? Um, that's where I, I think, you know, you can get frustrated with AI and we don't want to do that in education. I mean, students are here in our classroom. You know, I had um, uh, the international group um, meet with some of my folks and they said, how can we use AI to scale things? And I'm like, oh, let's not go down that road because now we're talking about, uh, you know, cultural nuances. And I don't think artificial intelligence would have that authentic intelligence to be able to pivot and know about culture and how things are perceived. So when, when I talk about authentic intelligence, it's really taking that artificial intelligence as a foundation and it's building upon that. So I love to use um, AI as a foundation for starting with ideas, especially with my students. Let's start with that, but let's not end with that. We need to start with the artificial intelligence and build with that authentic intelligence, which is that human part of it, that, that humanistic you know, feel and touch so that we can think about what we're doing and how we're, we're using artificial intelligence. And it's that critical thinking that we always talk about teaching our students. And I think that artificial intelligence really gives us a tool to dive into that critical thinking. Um, I'll just leave you with one exercise that I've done with my students and then I'll pass it on. Um, you know, I had my freshman class come in and, and I said, okay, let's, let's ask, you know, a question that you really know a lot about. And they started asking the questions and they're looking up and they're like, this isn't right. And I'm like, well, yeah. I go, it's learning. I go, so help it to learn. And, and we got so involved. And this is only a 50 minute class. I looked up and we had gone five minutes over class, which is not so good in a large university where you have a 10 minute passing period and students have to sometimes go all the way across class or all the way across campus to get to their next class. And everybody went into a panic. But I thought, wow, they were so engaged and so excited about this new technology that they just lost track of time. So I think it's it's an exciting tool, but it's also one that we really need to be thoughtful and careful about and really think about more of that authentic intelligence and how that builds on the artificial intelligence. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Melody. That sense of artificial intelligence being authentic intelligence to help us be more human, that is just very profound. Thank you so much. Can't wait to hear more from you later in the session. So next we have the University of Richmond's innovative Andrew Ilnicki. Hey there, um, thanks for having us. And um, I'm coming at this from a perspective of experiential education, project-based learning, and basically viewing um, elements of Gen AI as a productivity tool for maybe those who have never had the opportunity to build and dream in quite this way before. So um, for the context of today's conversation, I'm really looking at it as non-visual people maybe being able to do things um, with a tool that they've never had the ability to create quite as high that level of fidelity output before um, and bringing what's implicit to the explicit going from zero to one. So we teach a lot of different types of project-based courses from, yes, intro to Adobe Illustrator, InDesign, Photoshop. Um, and some of that has really been enabled by this new use of ChatGPT and Firefly. Instead of using stock images and lorem ipsum or Greek text, why don't we lay out a brochure or a magazine using ChatGPT and and firefly together to create you know a really robust uh first prototype um and so just over the last year really seeing students the light bulb go on for them 
I want to break into a visual design space or a visual art space. I don't have the portfolio. I've never had the training before. How do I do that? And so really seeing um, that ability to quickly make something in about five minutes that is high quality that could actually live in someone's portfolio um, and have them break into a career path that they've never really had the opportunity to do before. The world is becoming more and more interdisciplinary as we speak. I'm seeing all kinds of job postings where it's a multidisciplinary designer that leverages business, uh, psych, art, design, engineering, knowing all those lexicons and then putting the putting them together into some kind of like hybrid unicorn that we never really thought could exist, especially coming out of academia, where really the onus has always been about being um, good at one super specific thing. Moving into this new world of hybridity um, has been a, a big emphasis for, for our programs here at Richmond and also in sort of the larger mid-Atlantic ecosystem where we're, we're competing with New York and California for these positions. And we want to really keep our talent here. We think we have a really great opportunity here in the mid-Atlantic to really build some new infrastructure. And that requires talent. And that requires training them into the, the types of pipelines um, that are going to be attractive for this region. Gen AI is just the, the latest iteration of this. Um, we've been fighting for digital literacy to fluency for, for years. Um, almost 20 years of my career has been spent in this space, um, whether it was web design, then UX, and now generative AI is the newest tool du, uh, du jour. And it really has taken a lot of the air out of the conversation from VR, AR, XR, where we were so heavily invested um, only, you know, a few years ago. And now the new Apple Vision uh, Pro has come out. We're still here talking about Gen AI. So, I mean, I think when you really zoom out on this conversation, it is a massive disruptor. It will impact the workforce. Our stock answer that we give right now, and I'm probably every, everybody in the chat could agree, you're not going to lose your job to AI right now, but you're going to lose it to someone who is leveraging it or using it or is proficient with it. And I, and I do think young people today, students today, you have to be investing the time into understanding what it can do, where are the constraints, where can it go? But then also the, the flip side that we've all been talking about so far by the other amazing panelists where's the creativity where's the humanity where are the things that uh machine learning and language models can't do so well is it lack of computation calculation creativity where is the human element of this that we can lean into and having been a steam advocate including more arts more creativity in the curriculum for decades we're right back where we started as STEM alone is not the answer. We need to lean into this humanistic uh, capability and ability that we all have and we know um, cannot be outpaced by a machine. And so I could show a bunch of slides, but maybe I'll save them for later um, because it is a lot about student generated um, content uh, using the tools and we can get more into the discussion, but happy to uh, be here and thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks so much, Andrew. Can't wait to see some of those slides later this session as we dive deeper into Gen AI and learning outcomes and, and career readiness. All right, finally, we have Dr. Todd Taylor, who's typically the driver of these digital literacy cafes, but who we're honored to have today as a speaker. So, Todd. Thank you, Shauna. Thanks everyone for being here. My name is Todd Taylor, and my business card for Adobe has the unique title of Pedagogical Evangelist. I'm also still an English professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Where I've, been, where I've been since 1997, where I used to direct the writing program. And so I tend to see the whole world through the eyes of a writing program administrator. And I, I think a lot about transferable skills and about student learning outcomes and filling out accreditation reports that are demonstrating that what we're doing. And, and to kind of summarize my position today, I'm going to be a little bit provocative. And I'm going to say, even though generative AI is a revolutionary information technology, we've seen this before. We've been down this path before as educators and and and, and instructional technologists. When 
when word processing came out, when calculators came out, when the internet came out, when social media and web two came out, when Zoom took over our experiences in classrooms. And so we actually have, I think, a lot of experience in responding to new and emerging technologies. And so if I think about the kind of universal learning outcome that's been the same for a long time, it's what I have on the screen here, enabling all students everywhere across the curriculum to develop as critical, ethical, agile users of these emerging information technologies. And that critical, ethical, and agile dimension has never been more in focus than it is now. And so I'm going to quickly look at a bunch of resources that I, I, will, I will, will talk about briefly. This is a table from the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs Report that's forecasted what the most important skills are going to be that students need upon graduation. And I can't dive into this too specifically, but... What I want to point out is between twenty fifth the proje projection for 2015 and 2025, six of these categories are brand new on this list. That lets us know that things are developing so fast and so rapidly that what we need is agility. We need students who, who develop, have the experiences and habits of mind that when a new technology comes out, when a new version of AI comes out, they know how to engage with it critically, ethically, and agilely. I think at the same time, we think about what higher education has done and what first year writing programs, for example, are all about. It's about information literacy. It's about collecting the best data, information, evidence, or research, and then reasoning through that, through critical thinking skills by analyzing, synthesizing, studying that, that information, looking for patterns. And then this is increasingly important, and this is where we have sort of historically fallen short then communicating what you can do with that analysis by sharing, publishing, narrating, and presenting. And I think one of the really exciting potential for generative AI is just this, the ability to share or illustrate or communicate ideas in more power, powerful and potent digital ways. And so we've always been about those things. Our, our, our learning outcomes and our standards have always been about those kind of fundamental academic skills, about evidence-based reading, about communicating complex ideas, about understanding data, evidence, and research. And now we have a new, I don't like calling it a tool. I like to think of generative AI and, and these more potent information technologies as an instrument, with, which has a, an epistemological dimension through which we can see the world differently. And given that it is that significant, we need our students and we need everyone to be engaging with this as much as possible. And so that's my my view of the future of outcomes and skills that everyone needs to be a part of. Thank you so much, Todd. This is actually a perfect segue into one of the first questions that I would like to ask everybody on this panel. Um, what I heard everybody say was that we need to move forward with intention and with the intent to retain our humanity, but also to use this new instrument, to use Todd's phrase, um, in, in impactful ways to really serve our students. Matt, what you said at the beginning of the conversation, I think also perfectly summarizes some of what we've been hearing today, which is nothing has changed, everything has changed. And so the question that I have is, you know, I think when this new stuff appears on the scene, there is this impulse to really throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have to reinvent the wheel in some way. But like what I heard, what, what Todd was saying that we've seen these kinds of changes before and so I have a question for all of you what are some of the strategies that you all are all are using to maybe sustain or to enhance these past successes in terms of learning outcomes and developing skills in the age of AI I guess in other words what's working particularly well in this new context that's resonating with higher education's tried and true outcomes and skills and perhaps we can start with Matt Sure. So I think, and I alluded to this in my introduction, I think sound pedagogy is sound pedagogy. And if we think of our learning experiences in terms of our students being active participants in those experiences rather than passive observers, then I, I think we position them better to more meaningfully engage with generative AI technologies. So I think this, the style of lecture-based teaching where students are passive, I think those 
are more susceptible to what people think of as the as the quote unquote dangers of of generative AI. But I think when we incorporate active learning strategies and really make our students active, engaged, and invested participants in the learning experience, I think that translates. Uh, as it has with every technology, I think that translates well to having students use generative AI in meaningful ways as part of their learning experiences. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Melody, did you have something to add? Yeah, I think there's two different ways um, that I tend to use uh, generative AI. Uh, one, um, before I go into the classroom, um, I have been talking to generative AI. I, I think I need to name it. I don't like, I don't know, maybe I'm going to name it Gigi or something. Um, and, um, you know, I, so I talked to Gigi about what do we want to do in this class and what can we, uh, what are some of the outcomes? Here are the things I'm thinking about. And when I've done that, I've got some really great insight from Gigi. I mean, it's like, wow, you know, she, I'm getting these these different ideas about different kinds of learning outcomes. I mean, I don't know where it's coming from, but it's it's kind of interesting. So I take those and I kind of build on those. So I, I find that's one way that I'm using it. When I actually step into the classroom, um, I'm not a, a type of professor that just gets up and lectures. So I like to engage with my students, uh, whether it be uh, in the classroom or online. And I like to hear where they are in their journey with uh, generative AI. And it's really fascinating to hear my students um, because I, again, I told you I have freshmen all the way to graduate students, um, you know, what they're doing with this tool and how are they using it? And I think that's one of the reasons I really love being in education because I'm a lifelong learner. And it's so fun to hear what young people are doing with it. Um, one person said, oh, you know, my husband was having some trouble with um, dietary. We weren't sure what kind of food he needed to eat. And so I asked generative AI, you know, what we should do with this. And then I asked them to build a shopping list and uh, some recipes for us. I was like, wow, that's a really creative way uh, to use generative AI. I always think of it in an academic sense. But again, how can we use it in our common life? I mean, we do in a lot of ways, um, you know, with Alexa or Siri on our phone. But, um, you know, just hearing what our young people uh, and even older people are doing with AI uh, in their lives is uh, really interesting for me. Thanks, Melody. What I heard in both responses just now is this sense of active learning, being engaged, actively engaged. Thanks so much. Andrew, do you have any insights in this vein? Well, one of the things that we, we don't have an umbrella policy about generative AI use at the University of Richmond. Um, the faculty across all five schools from law to arts and sciences to business are experimenting with this in really unique ways. And the, the reason I know that is because we have a really robust faculty development um, section set up all about Gen AI across the curriculum. And that is run by our faculty um, hub, uh, Andrew Bell and, um, and others. And it was supported by the provost's office. Actually, in my first month at the University of Richmond, I got my first parent email forwarded to me from the provost about the concerns of generative AI on, on, on academic settings. And this is coming from a parent who is really concerned that I'm not seeing enough in across the curriculum, not only, you know, at your school, but in higher ed in general. And this was kind of uh, in the fall, a real concern of ours to sort of stand something up and are, are we doing enough? Are we experimenting enough? But then seeing the constraints of, well, it's actually really not all that great except for summarizing things that we already sort of like know are canon, whether it's English or philosophy or summarizing notes. Um, so struggling with this as a faculty has been really interesting to sort of watch, unfold, what are the legal implications of certain things as it hallucinates, where are the lawsuits coming from uh, and tracking that. So it's been sort of a week by week really engaged faculty body that's been wrestling with, with a lot of these issues. Um, as I stated at the very beginning, though, I view it as a really strong productivity tool. Now, you do have to know uh, 
<laughs> the limitations of it. There's a lot of garbage out there on the internet and it is some, somewhat of a black box, especially with chat GPT. You don't, you have to know enough about the subject matter that you're trying to utilize to be dangerous. Um, or even if you're just like a cursory fan of sports, ask it to summarize the top 10 greatest moments in, I'll take my example, New York Giants history. As you dig deeper, it will start attributing um, significant plays to people that weren't even alive at the time. So it's a language model. There's a lot of garbage out there. You have to know uh, what it is that you're trying to, to get it to do. And prompt engineering is not perfect either. So sometimes the more specific you get, the more that you'll you'll watch the model break down. And that will go for image generation as well as uh, chat regurgitation. So it's really great at, again, summarizing notes, maybe sprinkling in some additional you know, language for you or giving you some additional things to think about in terms of larger context of what you're asking it to do. Um, but it is not, it is not perfect. And in fact, in terms of the, the visual stuff, glitch art has a whole new <laughs> world unto itself of like generated glitches, even um, expand, expanding the canvas in Photoshop there is a phenomenal uh, trove of glitches that you can sort of like watch happen in real time. And it's the nature of the rabbit hole. I mean, we're sort of all, if you've experimented with it a little bit, you know how dangerously alluring this can be. Um, and I do have a lot of colleagues in the arts who are concerned. I mean, there is this level of concern of, is this going to take my job one day if I'm an illustrator or I'm a designer or like there goes that job for copywriting that they were going to pay a freelancer and now we're just going to have chat GPT write it. I mean, that, that is a concern. Um, but again, you have to know sort of like the limitations of, of the technology. It is absolutely imperfect. Um, I'm not ready to hit the panic button yet. Um, I do more or less encourage our students, especially to help raise the floor of the first draft iteration one, these tools can help you improve what you initially um, turn in both in terms of speech and visual work. It, it, it is a highly effective tool to getting you from zero to one. Thanks, Andrew. Sounds like what everybody is saying is that we're still interested in pedagogy and active learning um, in faculty development, and then also helping our students succeed. And that's, that's really great to hear, even in this age of AI, there are still some things that are still resonating. Um, Todd, did you have anything yeah, I've had the great privilege of touring around North America over the last few months since last spring. And we've just been having these conversations about what do we do, what, what's working. And I'm just going to share a couple practical things that I think align just in terms of that critical ability of, of picking this thing up and turning it over and looking at it from different angles to understand its limitations, its affordances and limitations and how it works. But we're going to have to keep doing that. Because as someone in the Q&A said, you know, this is going to keep changing. It's going to expand and, and morph. Uh, we're, we know we're going to quickly get into the realm of of large language models that aren't trained on the whole universe, but are trained on specific data sets, both in disciplines, but also just in terms of our own our own body of research. Um, one thing that I, think was, I thought was really promising was a, a math professor from the University of Houston was saying, what they were doing with great success is they were they were they were taking all these practice questions they had in calculus and they were asking chat gp to give the answers and then their students were responsible for figuring out when the answers were incorrect and it was something like over 50 percent of the time the answers weren't correct and i love that exercise because i think one of the most you know productive provocative productive things i do in my digital storytelling classes, I ask students all the time, why did you make that choice? Why did you cut the scene that way? Why did you pick this color or this font? Why did you choose these interview questions in this in the digital story you, you put together? And most of the time, they're so conditioned and going, oh, you mean I did something wrong? But most of the time when I ask students, why did you make that choice? It's because they've done something really effectively. And so what that does is to me that that's like the higher order critical thinking is not just assuming is, is, is reflecting on and looking deeply into 
uh, the way these technologies are working. And so what Melody just described, you know, find something you're an expert at, ask, uh, you know, generative AI to answer a question about it, and then use your own knowledge to, you know, assess how, how, how solid the information is. And that's where I'm beginning in a very practical way in terms of things that are working is is having students engage in critical analysis and reflection of how effective uh, these these tools are for what they're trying to do with it today. Thanks, Todd. Yes, Melody. So I want to kind of add to this because, um, you know, I've been to a lot of um, conferences or symposiums where we've been talking about this. And, you know, we're all at the higher higher education level. And I'm going to tell you a story about a third grade class because I think it's really important that we start getting students, kids, to think about critical thinking. Someone asked in the chat about this in third grade, not by the time they get to a freshman in college. We need to start, start in third grade. And I'll go back in time because my kids are now in their 20s. But when my one kid was in third grade, I went to his classroom. And you should never um, have a, a college professor come to a third grade classroom, by the way, because that's just trouble. Um, and they were doing some research on Martin Luther King. And of course, back then we just had the internet and it was kind of locked down in the, in the school systems. And we were looking at, at um, web pages and um, one web page came up and I, and I said to the class, I said, does this not feel right to you? What's wrong about this page? And we started like looking at this page and kind of, you know, and the kids were like, yeah, it's kind of a strange, it's got a kind of strange vibe to it. And you know, as third graders kind of pick things apart in, in their ways that they do. And I said, well, who do you think created this? Because that's what's important is who created this? And they're like, yeah, yeah, who created it? Well, we went and we found out it was a white supremacy group that had created this page on Martin Luther King. Yeah. And so I was like, oops. And the kids are like, what's white supremacy? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to hand this back to the teacher, which is why you shouldn't have a college professor come into a third grade classroom. But, you know, I'm sure she got calls all about, you know, that. But the thing, the point of my story is, I think we should start poking at this in third grade, getting students to like, look at information critically, whether it comes from the news media, whether it comes from generative AI, whether it comes from the internet, everybody has an agenda. And so you have to really poke at that. So generative AI is not anything different. Andrew, I love how you said it's a large language model. That's another thing we need to teach our students is how is this information being pulled? They don't really understand it. A lot of us don't understand these large language models. So it's like, you know, getting them to understand how this is being pulled, where it's being pulled from, and the biases that come into what you're getting fed. And I think that's really important and why we need to start not as a freshman in college, but in third grade. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox there about that one. I love it. Thanks so much, Melody. That really um, that really centers this conversation around what we're really trying to do in higher ed and also to prime students all the way in the third grade to start critically thinking. Uh, what I'm noticing in the chat, as well as in some of the responses that you had to this first question about, you know, what hasn't really changed that we're still supporting even in the age of AI, let's go to the other side of that. What is changing and what are the unique challenges to developing student outcomes and skills around gen AI um, in this completely different context, especially, I mean, people in the chat have been saying, is it maybe somewhat promoting not learning? Is it um, taking away opportunities to really think critically about our curriculum and the way that we support students? So what, what do you all have to say about that? And Matt, if you'd like to start or anybody else, feel free. I'll let someone else start this time. Sounds great. Really quickly, um, some of the concerns, uh, it, the technology equity um, is a big issue. How do we, even as we've rolled our own um, chat GPT for um, application and can spin up tutors for different classes here across the university, um, there's a lack of equity there. And so funding obviously is, is going to be an issue, but even um, the perception of, uh, I, I think it was about over four, it's not quite half, but over 40% of students surveyed um have an, an avoidance mentality because they're concerned about cheating, plagiarism, somehow, you know, <laughs> losing their seat at the table. And so that is a concern. 
uh, more among our students than anything. But then we also know over 70% of our international students have a quite different perspective and would not want to lose the ability to utilize uh, these tools because it actually helps them um, because they're not native speakers. And so, again, it's about sort of raising the, the floor of and the quality of work of what's turned in. You know, those are those are significant issues. And I don't think a blanket policy or a fear of like a lack of learning is actually happening um, is, is going to adequately um, address those issues. Um, and I, I did see that one about about do we sort of like not learn anymore? No, I, I, I do think it's changing. I think the end-to-end -end process looks a little bit different and it's definitely not what we are used to or grew up with. Um, but addressing, you know, that, that workflow and the access to the technology so that it's equitable um, is, is sort of the approach that, that I usually take on, on those kinds of issues. Um, Matt, I know you have a ton to say on this, uh, on this issue. So thank you for letting me scoot in. Of course. So I've in prior talks, I've I've made comparisons to the fear of pocket calculators that emerged in the mid 1970s. And there's a really amazing New York Times article. I think it's January uh, 1975. And it's about this great debate about pocket calculators now that they're finally becoming more or less affordable than than they were previously. And the article talks about these two camps of primarily math educators, some who think it's going to be the worst thing to ever happen to math education, and others who think that it's that it's going to be this amazing liberating force in math education because we can stop focusing on the mi minute details and start to think about real world problems. We can start to uh, teach whether the, the answers the students are getting are reasonable or not based on estimation. And here we are many decades later, and the world has not ended, and we all do have a calculator in our pocket at all times. Um, I know there are probably differences of opinion as to whether math skills are better or worse now than they were in the 70s. Um, but sort of to, to Todd's point about how we've dealt with this before as, as educators and as societies, I, I think that this is something that we will continue to uh, integrate into our daily lives, integrate into our classrooms. And I think the overall fear is, is going to be somewhat temporary. Now, despite that comparison, there are things that are different about this one. So calculators give correct answers. Generative AI systems don't always give correct answers. Back to Andrew's point before with the glitch art and the, the, the sports stories, um, there are issues that will manifest in the outputs of generative AI systems because they're not intended, they're not built to be correct answer machines. They're statistical models that generate likely tokens. So I think that changes things a little bit. And I think the way to approach this is through promoting AI literacy and fluency with our students, just like it has been with every technology is for students not only to know how to use it, but know the limitations and how these things work. 100% absolutely. Wow. The limitations and affordances kind of reminds me of what Todd was talking about a little bit earlier. Does anyone else have any thoughts on or reflections on the challenges that we're uniquely facing this time? You know, one thing, I, um, oh, oh, oh ahead, I'm sorry, Melody. Go no, no, go ahead, Andrew, please. I just neglected to mention it earlier. Um, I did have one outspoken faculty basically wrestle with this notion that establishing a strong a faculty student relationship and having those iterations over time to establish that deep connection feels like we're losing that. And uh, the word that was used at the time was we're outsourcing this to a bot. And that is a major concern that I'm sure other faculty, um, well, all human beings are, are wrestling with. And I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I'll build on that a little bit because, of course, you know, we hear, oh, cheating, cheating, cheating. You know, and I'm like, yeah, well, they're not going to do so well <laughs> if they cheat with generative AI um, because it's really not there yet. But I think it 
goes down to those basic principles of the andragogy um, that you know we we need to build on, which is why are we using it? What is the purpose? Um, and you know we need to talk to our students about this. Is why are you using generative AI? Is it because it's late at night, you've got an assignment due tomorrow, and you just don't want to do it, and you push the easy button. Is that the reason you're using generative AI? Or are you using generative AI to learn? Which, um, that's how I use it. And so I kind of model that to my students to say, you know, if you turn in an assignment that is just a pure, I push the easy button, and I turned it in, you know, that's really not a good reason. You're really cheating yourself. Now, on the flip side, we as educators need to think about our assessment practices. And this is where I think there's great opportunity, especially in a teaching and learning center, because I can like poke at that a little with faculty who just want to push their easy button and have assessments that are easily, you know, you can easily use generative AI to answer. And you really want, again, I hate to go back to that critical thinking, but you really want students to think deeply, not just answer a question in a moat way. You know, I always say, oh, I hate those final exams where students cram and cram and cram, and then they go in and they spit out all that information, and then they go to the bar and they do the beer wipe. Thank God I'll never have to think about that topic again. We have educators have failed when we do that kind of assessment. And so I think we really need to internalize this and get students to think about how they're using these tools because it's just a tool, just like a calculator. Yes, it's a little more sophisticated. I think it has great opportunity. I'm so excited to see where it's going to go. I really want to get to Blade Runner and like iRobot. I really want to get there. But, you know, we're not there yet. But I, I see great promise in in going there and to have something like that and i think it would benefit society but we do have to be very careful and we have to be very critical and we have to start at third grade not when they're 18 <laughs> thanks i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna talk out, out of both sides of my mouth i start out by saying ah, oh, yeah we can deal with this we've done it before with emerging information technologies but to answer the question, I think there is something distinct about this one. And this, again, is my you know view on the world. I co-authored a book in 1997 on citation. If anyone's ever having trouble falling asleep, uh, you can read that. Um, and so one of the, the, my big concerns for critical thinking and evidence-based reasoning, which is the, the heart of academic work, is the way large language models and these algorithms and, and machine language conceal the sources of where these ideas came from, where the information is coming from. In the internet, you can always kind of trace where it came from. But now it's it's this amalgamation, often a hallucination, of all kinds of sources mixed in together that are indistinguishable. And so when something is presented as correct or a fact or information, we might not necessarily know where it came from unless we specifically ask the model to give us sources. But that's, uh, this seems, and this was a comment in the chat pod, this is expanding so rapidly, I don't think these models are too concerned about leaving those trail of breadcrumbs. And to me, that infrastructure of attribution and citation and copyright is really important, not just in terms of policing and fairness and who's cheating and who's not, but in terms of language, uh, in terms of knowledge construction, we can figure out what, how this piece of knowledge relates to this one and who said this when and in what context to evaluate the, the quality and the relevance of a, of a piece of information or data. And so I am concerned about that disrupting in an in a almost unsolvable way our ability to do evidence-based reasoning and critical thinking. If, if we don't come up with an infrastructure for attribution to to whatever is being claimed or forward is is being knowledge or a fact. So that that is unique to this to this technology at this moment. Thanks for adding that, Todd. This black box um, aspect of AI and how we have to really 
probe into those uh, unknowns in order to get a better sense of how to move forward. Speaking of moving forward, I cannot believe that we are almost at the end of this hour. This conversation has been so incredible. Before we leave, I was wondering if each of you could maybe just say a couple of sentences about how you would recommend people who are interested in these conversations to help lead these conversations on in their um, in their classrooms or on their campuses. Um, how can we continue this work, whether it's on a large scale or a small scale, especially as it relates to career readiness and student outcomes? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um... You know, Andrew, you didn't bring this up, but this is in our pre-meeting. I think faculty learning communities are a really great way to get with your peers. Um, I love them because people are at different levels. People are at different disciplines. And you can really get this diversity of thought um, around how people are using uh, generative AI in the classroom. You, you can talk about your fears. You can talk about opportunities. You can talk about challenges. But having a peer group come together um, from across your institution and talking about how you're implementing that in the classroom or in your own practice, I think that's one, one thing that thought that I would, would like to leave you with. And sorry, Andrew, I think I stole your thunder there. I totally agree. And people are like, we're having IP law or um, comics generated by Firefly and Mid Journey for legal implications as a way to explain really robust, high jargon topics to uh, the general public. And so it's a really great pick, pick one project. I'm, I'm big on project based learning, of course. But pick one out of a, if you have three or four or five projects, um, as, is, as is common in one of my sections, pick one where a single demo of ChatGPT or Firefly or something else um, and experiment with it and make sure that the students know that your policy in that class does not apply broad <laughs> broadly. Each faculty will have their different policies in their syllabus. So just make sure that everybody knows um, that this is good for this class and check with the other faculty before you violate any, any codes of ethics elsewhere. But um, definitely establish a faculty learning community um, that is diverse, as, uh, as Melody suggested. It's phenomenal. Um, we have a really thriving group here. Thank uh, shout out to the faculty hub, Andrew Rubell. You're doing phenomenal. Thank you, Linda Boland, for leading this from the administration on down. It's been it's been great. Matt. Thanks so much, Andrew. In the last two or two minutes or so, Matt and Todd, any final words? Sure. Uh, plus one on the faculty learning communities, um, and leveraging your peer communities at your institutions and also leverage the resources at your institutions visit your teaching center talk to your faculty development folks they are grappling with this stuff all day every day and they're going to be amazing resources for you uh instructional design folks at your institutions uh talk to them too um also more more broadly and maybe a little more philosophically find a balance between being brave and adventurous and skeptical Absolutely. Uh, plus 1,000 on the efficacy of faculty learning communities. I like to think that the, the Digital Literacy Cafe is a is a, vir a virtual version of that. You know, the, the cafe has been going for a couple of years now. And since the topic has been about generative AI, I really look forward to coming into these conversations and learning something new, uh, hearing different perspectives and sharing uh, the insights from everyone. And as, as, thanks also to everyone who put something in the Q&A really provocative. And so, yeah, I think that's the way we, what we have, we're in this together. It's, it's going to be iterating and growing and uh, it's never been a better time to learn from each other. So thanks for the opportunity today, Shauna. Thanks so much to all four of you for just being the most incredible panelists and talking about these conversations uh, about generative AI career out, uh, learning outcomes and career readiness in such intentional human centered ways. Uh, I, what's clear from the response in both the Q&A 
as well as in the conversation today as we can talk endlessly about this topic. I can't even believe that we have only three minutes left, but I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom and your um, your advice on how to move forward in this time of uncertainty, but also excitement. Um, I just wanted to also remind everybody who has attended here. We have lots more digital literacy cafes and we hope that you join us again for more conversations. Thank you for the amazing questions that you put in the Q&A function. Sorry, we weren't able to get to all of them, but you also, I love the information sharing that happened too with the links and things like that. There will be a recorded uh, version of this session that will be available on demand. So feel free to check that out if you wanted to revisit any of the amazing insights or to share this information with, with others on your campuses. I hope you are all well. Thank you um, again to the panelists and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks everyone.